Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome, family. Welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday for the month of September, where we are always pleased to have our founder and director, Anthony Browder, as the presenter. Before we get started with tonight's program, just want to remind you about who we are at IKG. IKG Cultural Resource Center is an organization, again, founded by Tony Browder, meant to bring forth a variety of activities and services related to African history and culture, including the monthly lecture series of Wisdom Wednesday. Thank you for joining us this evening. As you all are coming in, we invite you to let us know where you are checking in from. Just as a reminder for tonight's program, all video and all audio is automatically muted. And we ask that you engage throughout the evening using the chat box. And at the end of tonight's program, we always have a, a Q&A portion and you can put your questions for our presenter in the Q&A box throughout the evening. And at the end, we will get to your questions and get some answers. So as we always do, we'd like to welcome you all. And we wanna acknowledge our family checking in from New York City, of course, Washington, DC. We have Maryland College Park in the house. We have Detroit, welcome Detroit, welcome Atlanta. Welcome Philadelphia, welcome Montana, Inglewood, California, Warren, uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, we have, let's see where else, we've got people from Bowie, Maryland, okay. Uh, let's see, uh, Las Vegas, welcome. Kigali, Rwanda, welcome, welcome, welcome from the motherland. Lawrenceville, Georgia, Portland, Oregon. Tampa, Florida, Brooklyn, Brooklyn is in the house. Welcome, Georgia, North Carolina, all right. England, okay, is in the house. York, Pennsylvania, so keep letting us know where you're checking in from. Chicago, all right. So as you see, we have family from all over the world um, that checks in. And so we are so happy that we're able to host our Wisdom Wednesday programs now where everyone is able to uh, participate in the great knowledge that is shared. So tonight will be no different. We are pleased to have Nana Segu Karak the first, as we know him, Anthony Browder, the founder and director of IKG, author, historian, Egyptologist, wonderful friend, Jegna. September 21st is the 15th anniversary of the Asa Restoration Project which was established in 2008 to preserve the educational and scholarly legacy of Dr. Asa G. Hilliard III by documenting the 25th dynasty's Kushite presence in Kemet. When this undertaking began, we were funding the excavation, conservation, and restoration of the tombs of three Kushite noblemen. And by we, we're referring to, to the project led by Tony Browder. Since our humble beginnings, we have discovered more than 35 tombs. Plans are currently underway to open three major tombs on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt in 2025. In his 15th annual report of the, to the community, Browder will also discuss plans for the expansion of the Asa Restoration Project in the United States and his ongoing efforts to counter narratives to minimize and distort African and African-American history in America and abroad. Central to this discussion, he will share information about the forthcoming documentary on Monoko Rashidi, the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project, the Cultural Imperative Program, and the Grand Plans for 20. 25. So please join me in welcoming the great Jegna Tony Browder as he provides us with the 2023 update on the ASA Restoration Project. Thank you, Adra. Thank yes. you so very much. It is, it is a, it's a joy to be able to 
sit back and watch you host these monthly Wisdom Wednesday sessions. When I <clears throat> began uh, Wisdom Wednesday in 2005, I had no idea that it would expand to become the incredible teaching tool that it has been. We started off hosting it at our IKG Culture Resource Center, which was then located in Northeast DC on 8th Street. And we had no idea that our reach would expand worldwide. So I'm so incredibly uh, proud of what we have accomplished. And I'm incredibly pleased that I have been able to hand off my baby, my Wisdom 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 Wednesday baby to you, Adjua, and you have taken care of my child. You have nurtured her. You have allowed her to grow and flourish uh, such that we're doing some phenomenal work influencing people all over the world. And I have freed myself up to do some other things with uh, time, which um, has a tendency to be a bit too fleeting. And you become aware of how quickly time moves the older you get. I think there's a direct uh, relationship between um, the, the length of time you live on this planet and the shorter time becomes. I'm, I'm sure some scientists have some explanation for that, but I'm feeling that. And it makes me feel so wonderful to know that I have an incredible team of people who have been with me, who have been with IKG for uh, well over 15, 16 years now and who are making it possible for me to hand off pieces of this very important endeavor to those souls that have proven themselves to be worthy of nurturing uh, my babies into the future. So with that, let's talk about this program. As uh, Ajua mentioned, uh, this is our 15th year doing our report to the community on the ASA Restoration Project. When the project was established, um, it was intended to be a project that was going to be funded by you, funded by members of the community, which would allow us to do something that no other people of African ancestry have ever done before. And that was to fund and coordinate archeological excavations. And brothers and sisters, we've made history on multiple levels. And I am obligated to just share with you what we've done and what we are going to do. Uh, today's program is no different uh, but today's program will also be uh, very different and very special. Let me start by referencing the 10-minute the clip that we shared before the program actually began. It was an interview with uh, Muhammad Ali that someone just recently sent to me earlier this week. And as I watched that interview, I decided I wanted to use that to begin our program because it, it fits my narrative. Uh, as many of you all know, I was born and raised in Chicago. I lived the first 21 years of my life in Chicago before I came here to Washington, D.C., where I've lived for the last uh, 50, 52 years. But growing up in Chicago, um, my life was shaped by the events of the 50s and 60s. I was born in 1951. I was um, three years old when Emmett Till was murdered. Um, I was 14 years old when Malcolm X was killed. I was 17 when Dr. King was killed. Um, I remember when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed. They lived on the west side, not too far from me. I remember the Black uh, Power Movement in D.C. I remember the Black in, in, in Chicago. I remember the Black Consciousness Movement. So all of these activities that took place in the 1960s, which I will, I will firmly believe for the rest of my life, the 1960s were the most significant decades in American history and maybe even world history because of the profound transformation of consciousness that took place within uh, the consciousness of African Americans and how that transformation of consciousness changed America and influenced the world. There is or has been no other decade as powerfully significant as um, the 1960s. And granted, I'm prejudiced, but uh, I know of what I speak. I also remember uh, growing up in Chicago and, and, and traveling throughout, throughout the country. Uh, I saw the last vestiges of American segregation. Uh, I, I remember seeing 
the whites only signs. I remember when our family was driving from Chicago to um, California in, what was that? That was 1961, I was 10 years old. And I remember uh, my family, my mother, my aunt and uncle and my cousin were not allowed to stay in um, motels in the South simply because we're black. So these memories are etched in my mind. So what Muhammad Ali was talking about at the top of this program was a reflection of, of my life. These memories are seared into my consciousness and they have helped to shape everything that I've done throughout my career. Everything that I've done relative to uh, learning about African and African-American history and culture, and more importantly, uh, dedicating my, my time, my talent, and my treasure to sharing historical information with as many of my people as possible, because I take all of this information near and dear to heart. So the ASA Restoration Project is an extension of IKG. It's an extension of Egypt on the Potomac. It's an extension of everything that I have dedicated my life to do in terms of raising the awareness of people of African descent specifically. That's my primary focus. And I, I make no bones about that. Uh, I understand very clearly that when there is a crisis, you take care of family first. And once your family is taken care of, if you have the opportunity and the time to take care of others, to help others, you do that. But the first priority is family. Um, that has always been my priority. I was taught that as a child. I have lived that all of my adult life and I would die living and following those same tenets. So tonight is um, the 15th report on the ASA Restoration Project. And I want to share my screen so that I can um, begin my PowerPoint. And in talking about the ASA Restoration Project this evening, I want to do something uh, a little different because you know I've been so involved in this work for uh, 14 years, uh, going on 15 years tomorrow, that I sometimes forget that there are people out there that have never heard of IKG, have never heard of me, who've never heard of the ASA Restoration Project. So as I talk about the things that we're doing, um, I forget sometimes that I'm neglecting a lot of people who have no idea. So what I'd like to do this evening is to do a recap of, of the ASA Restoration Project and why I have dedicated 14 years of my life to doing this work. And I'll be honest with you, when I first began this project in 2008, I thought that um, it would be five years or six years at most, and I would move on to, to writing more books and, and doing other projects. I had no idea that I would have committed um, 14 years of my life to this work, but it's been a phenomenal investment in my life, and it has paid off in spades. And I want you all to, to understand what has motivated me to devote so much of my time to this work. So... <clears throat> As many of you all know, I've been traveling to Egypt for uh, 43 years. Uh, this past July, I made my 66th trip to Egypt. And if all goes well, I'll be making my 67th trip to Egypt in December when we take our, our next group for our winter solstice uh, sunrise uh, activity. So I've invested a lot of time in Egypt because I found that history, that culture to be fascinating. I've cultivated friendships with hundreds of people in Egypt over the past 43 years and have come to see Egypt as, um, have come to love Egypt as much as I love Washington, D.C. Um, and my hometown, Chicago. I've come to love uh, many uh, friends that I have um, become acquainted with over the decades. And it's added joy to my life. But the question that sometimes comes up to me is what got me started in this? And the person responsible for getting me interested in Egypt is none other than the great Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, who I met February 21st, 1977 at Georgetown Law School, when he talked about his newly published book that came before Columbus, The African Presence in America. It is a classic. And it was Van Sertema during that presentation who spoke about the Africans who had traveled from the Nile Valley across the Atlantic Ocean 
and help to bring technology culture to to the Americas, specifically to the um, uh, to Mexico, uh, 2,500 years before Christopher Columbus was born. This information was mind blowing, but what truly triggered my imaginations was when Van Sertima said that these Africans were from the Nile Valley, uh, from, from Egypt and Kush, and they were black. This was the first time in my life anyone had ever told me that the ancient Egyptians were black. And this information contradicted everything that I had been taught in every school that I had attended throughout my life. It contradicted movies that I'd seen, information that I'd seen on television or read in books, and it made me aware of the fact that there was a wealth of information that I knew nothing about. So I began reading what I now refer to as forbidden knowledge. I discovered uh, scholarship. I discovered a world that had been intentionally hidden from me. So the Muhammad Ali piece that I paid, played at the very beginning uh, speaks to that fact that we have been a hoodwink, as Malcolm said, we've been lied to, uh, we have been taken advantage of. Uh, and as a result of that historical and cultural uh, manipulation, many of us are lost. We're deaf, dumb, and blind, to use the metaphor that the Nation of Islam uses quite frequently. And so I was about freeing myself. I, I was interested in wanting to know more about who I was. And then once I gained that information, I was dedicated to share that knowledge with as many people as possible, hence the creation of IKG in 1982. So this organization is 41 years old. Uh, I have dedicated my life to doing this work. And if all goes well, um, I will end my life doing this work. But the person who really sh helped shape my character was none other than um, Baba A.C.G. Hilliard III. And I love this quote from Asa, uh, who implored us to understand that whatever you do, don't allow them to begin your history in slavery. And Muhammad Ali, even though he didn't speak directly to that point, he did at the beginning of that interview when the man referred to him as, uh, as Negro. And he said, we're not Negro. Uh, we're no longer Negro. Back in the 60s, we began to, to push that uh, Portuguese word aside and began to see ourselves as Black, bringing dignity to Black. And then ultimately, we began to see ourselves as African. And then even later still, we began to see ourselves as African-Americans. So associating your name, our name, with land, language, history, and culture is paramount. And it's important, it's critically important for us not to allow others to begin our story with, in slavery. So our story goes back uh, thousands and thousands of years. And Dr. Hilliard, throughout his career as an educational psychologist, documented our story and opened tens of thousands of minds throughout the United States and all around the world. And central to many of his teachings was the African presence in the Nile Valley, specifically in Kemet, the country now known as Egypt. So one of Ace's um, significant books is the teachings of Ptah Hotep, the oldest book in the world. Another uh, important book that Ace Hilliard um, was responsible for editing was, a, uh, was the proceedings of a conference that he held in 19... Um, 89, on the infusion of African-American content into the school curriculum. Asa was responsible for initiating the Portland Baseline Essays in the 1980s, which was considered to be one of the first African-centered curriculums. And Asa was adamant about centering our knowledge of the world on Africa, which is where the first people in the world lived. And the first and oldest documented civilization can also be found. So to be African-centered is to be rooted in truth. And one of my favorite books by Dr. Hilliard is called Saba, The Reawakening of the African Mind. Uh, this is my favorite book of Asa. And, and you will notice that he incorporates a lot of comedic themes and comedic elements in his teachings because that is in fact the foundation, the cultural foundation of, of world history and African history. And for people of African ancestry to embrace this knowledge is not the appropriation of anybody else's history or culture. It's an acknowledgement of truth. 
And we have to stand on truth and build on truth. Dr. Hilliard was also responsible for helping to organize the Nile Valley Conference, which was held at Morehouse College in 1984. I attended that four day event. And as I sat in the audience, my mind was blown as I listened to speaker after speaker after speaker talk about the African origins of Nile Valley civilization, comedic culture and civilization. And these were experts in the field, Egyptologists, mathematicians, uh, scientists, philosophers, uh, psychologists. And you notice looking at this picture here, you'll see this is from 1984. So you'll see Dr. Hilliard here. You'll see a young Charles Finch, uh, a young Naeem Akbar, uh, Hunter Adams. Uh, here's Renoka Rashidi, uh, Larry Obadelli Williams. Uh, this is a power packed conference. And as I sat in the audience and listened to all of these scholars and had my mind liberated, I said, this is what I want to dedicate my life to doing. And I also made a commitment to myself that I was going to find a way, I was going to not find a way, create a way to bring some of these scholars to Washington, D.C. so that I could share their information with my community. One of the highlights of the conference was to have been the appearance of uh, Sheikh Antijab, but uh, there were technical problems with his playing and he was forced to return to Senegal. So he was not able to participate uh, in the Nile Valley Conference, but he did come to Atlanta several months later and Asa and, and, and Charles Finch were able to show him the town. It was during uh, Jop's visit to Atlanta in um, 84 that he was given an honorary um, doctorate from Morehouse. He was honored by SCLC. He also had the opportunity to travel to the West Coast to do some presentations. He traveled to Chicago, and that was his first and only visit to the United States before he died less than two years later. So Dr. Hilliard was responsible for introducing me into a world of, of scholars that let me know that I needed to begin to commit myself to re-educating myself to a vast field of knowledge that was not a part of my formal educational process. Um, Asa is also well known for a 13 part television series he did with Elizabeth Middleton on South Carolina educational television. These programs aired three times a week on Howard University's TV station, WHUT. And uh, that 13 part series consisted of 13 30 minute programs. And the theme of the program was free your mind, return to the source. And Kemet played, the history of Kemet was a central theme that Asa repeated throughout these 13 part series. And it just reinforced in my mind, the importance of Nile Valley culture and civilization. So in 1987, when I began to fulfill my promise to myself and my DC community, I created Memorial Day weekend, our very first free of mind lecture. And our very first presenter was none other than Asa Hilliard. So, you know, Asa has meant the world to me. And um, he also has influenced my uh, interest in Egypt. The study tours that I've been doing um, to Egypt since 1987 are modeled after the study tours that I uh, had took uh, with Asa Hilliard. I think I did four study tours with Asa. And um, as our relationship grew, um, I asked Asa to write the introduction to my very first book from the Browder file, which was published in 1989. And the essence that I asked Asa to incorporate in his introduction were some of the words that he shared with us at a very first Free Your Mind lecture series, Memorial Day weekend, 1987. So when the book came out in 1989, very few people had ever heard of Tony Browder, but everyone knew Asa. And having Asa's name on my book has helped to make that book a bestseller in 1989, and is still a perennial bestseller over 30, 31 years later. Asa and I shared um, friendship with a number of people. Um, 
the photograph that you see in the lower left-hand corner is a photograph taken in Egypt. Uh, it was actually taken um, on, um, on the island of Fele in Aswan. Uh, it's a picture of Asa and my dear friend, my good brother, Akmi Ra. Akmi Ra lived in Maryland, and he was my he was my comedic uh, history study partner. Um, Akmi Ra wrote a book entitled Let the Ancestors Speak, Removing the Veil of Mysticism from Medu Nature. Asa wrote the introduction to that book, and Akmi Ra was one of a handful of of, of students who actually learned Medu Nature from a master. Ankmi Ra learned Medu Nature from Dr. Ted Philobinga, who, as you all should know, uh, was with Sheikh Antijab in 1974 at the Cairo Symposium, where they had a discussion about the race, about the ethnicity of the ancient Egyptians. And Dr. Obinga and Dr. Jop literally answered that question to, to such an extent that no one was able to refute their evidence. Yet here we are in 2023, still debating an issue that was uh, resolved over 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago. So, you know, history has a way of repeating itself. And the mistakes and errors in history have a way of repeating itself, which is why it's so critically important that we develop the language, we develop the thinking, we develop the skills to be able to articulate what is historically accurate information and then share that information with every person with the capacity to receive it and the desire to use that information to improve their quality of life. Uh, Ankh Ra learned Medi Nature from Obinga because Obinga lived with Akmi Ra and his family as his wife was working to secure Obinga's green card so that he could teach um, in colleges here in the United States. Obinga taught at Temple University uh, and then later at uh, San Francisco State University. And Ak would, would tell me stories about how he and Obinga would stay up at night drinking beer and learning Meta Nature. Um, so it was a joy for me to have these conversations with Dr. Ra. And as I was focusing on doing my work, I didn't have the time or the energy to get involved in learning to read and write Meta Nature. Uh, it's such a dense and complex language that I, I felt my time was better spent focusing on activities that were better suited to my skill set. So Ankhmi Ra was my Meta Nature partner. Whenever I had a question about anything, I could go to him. Whenever I need something translated, I would go to him and he would provide me the translation. Uh, or whenever he discovered something in, in reading text, he would come to me uh, and just share his discoveries. So we developed a partnership. We had actually done a couple of study tours to Egypt together. And it was a beautiful partnership. It was a beautiful uh, friendship and brotherhood that sadly came to an end on July the 1st, 2007, was when my friend Akmi Ra passed and became an ancestor. And then just 44 days later, Asa Hilliard passed in Egypt after giving the opening keynote presentation at the ASCAP conference in Aswan. So the loss of my two good friends um, hurt me. It hurt me to, to my core. And as I was grieving the loss of these men, grieving the loss of Asa, I knew I needed to find a way to, to help me, help liberate myself from my grief. And that opportunity came in July of... Um, 2008, when my Egyptian guide at that time, Abu Naga Gabriel, who is like a brother to me, who worked hand in hand with me for 21 years. Uh, my dear friend uh, introduced me to uh, Alina Pistakova, who had just two years prior discovered the lost tombs of South Asasif. He knew that I would be interested in this. Uh, he made arrangements for me to meet Alina I met her, she gave me a, a tour of the partially excavated um, first pillar hall of Karaka Men's tomb. I saw the seriousness in Alina. I saw her heart uh, and I knew 
that what she was involved in was something that I needed to be involved in. And I made a commitment to help raise funds so this work could continue. Alina insisted that I come and not only raise funds, but I come and be actively involved in that process. Now, I'm not a fundraiser, I'm not an archeologist, but I have learned to, to do things that have helped to shape my life. And as I thought about committing myself to this work, I thought about where we were. We were in an area on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt, known as South Asasif, A-S-A-S-I-F. And as I looked at that word, Asasif, I saw Asa in Asasif, A-S-A-S-I-F. So I decided to name the project the Asa Restoration Project in honor of my friend, my colleague, my brother. And the theme of the Asa Restoration Project is that it is dedicated to the restoration of the Kushite presence in Kemet and the preservation of the legacy of Dr. Asa G. Hilliard III. So it was a two-pronged uh, project that was to help restore this lost knowledge of the 25th dynasty and to follow in the footsteps of my friend and to preserve historical information and make it accessible to people with the greatest need to know. So that has been the work of the Asa Restoration Project. And uh, I want to share with you a, a trailer that uh, my dear friend Chris Reiser did for us uh, around uh, 2015 that showcases some of the work that we've done with the Asa Restoration Project. So here is the trailer. Tony, can you reshare with the sound? Okay. Can you hear the sound, really? Um, Okay, I was just informed that you all can hear the sound. So Atlantis has come here to help me, help your father, Atlantis. What do we have to do? Stop share and share sound. Ah, optimize for click that too. Optimize. There we go. And then share and um. Uh, Okay, and we will start again and full screen and make it happen. Okay, thank you, daughter.
So uh, the footage that you saw was shot during our study tour to Egypt in 2016. And that was the year that we did um, study tour, worked at the site, and then got together with Renoka Rashidi and spent a week in Sudan. So the last shot you saw was the Pyramid Field in Merrillway. That was a phenomenal trip. And traveling from Kemet to Kush just reinforced in my mind the significance, the importance of connecting Egypt to all of Nile Valley uh, civilization. We can't see it as a separate nation. It is part of a continuum. And when we look at that history, that great history from that perspective, it expands our understanding of everything that we thought we knew about Kemet, everything that we thought we knew about ancient Egypt. And I, it's, I'd like to take this time to recommend that all of you all uh, get a copy of Dr. Charles Finch's latest book, Nile Valley Civilization, a 10,000 year history. Dr. Finch has done a, mar a remarkable job of connecting Egypt to Kush, to Ethiopia, to Kenya, to Uganda, to, to look at the entire history of Nile Valley civilization and to be able to uh, connect that history and culture with uh, the rest of the African continent, which is a phenomenal, um, a phenomenal work that I encourage you all to support. So I wanna give you a brief 14 year retrospective of the Asa Restoration Project. We started out in 2008 with three tombs. Today, we have over 39. We've worked through three presidential administrations. We worked through the, the ousting, the removal of two presidents, President Mubarak and President Morsi. We worked through three years of COVID. I remember during uh, the COVID um, virus, there were a couple of years where we were the only foreign mission working in Egypt. So we were able to prove to our Egyptian friends, our Egyptian colleagues, the seriousness of our commitment to doing this work and the importance of us working with people who understood the value of our mission. Um, we had originally planned to, to open the site in 2023 this year, but because of the um, political issues in Egypt that interfere with our ability to work on some occasions because of COVID, we were forced to push that opening back to 2025. Uh, and so we're still looking at that, that target date, but I wanna give you an update and share with you where things are right now, where things are uh, at, this, uh, at this moment. And um, this is important because I have talked about this to some people, but I haven't shared it with um, uh, a larger audience. And I wanna take the opportunity to do that this evening. 43 weeks ago, on November the 27th of 2022, last year, I was experiencing some chest pains. And Atlantis took me to the uh, ER, and I was informed by the ER doctors that I was having a heart attack. I was actually hospitalized for five days, and I was treated for congestive heart failure with low ejection fraction um, and was released from the hospital on December the 2nd. Now, and I was given at that time when I was released the best medications available to modern medicine to treat my condition. It just so happened that I was supposed to be traveling to Egypt to do a study tour um, to do our, what was then I think our third annual winter solstice um, study tour. And my cardiologist said, Mr. Browder, you aren't going anywhere. And rather than cancel that study tour, this past December, Atlantis Browder, who's traveled to Egypt with me uh, now 18 times, was able to step up, step in, and lead her very first study tour. Uh, and she did a phenomenal job. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, um, as I look back on it, it was worth me getting sick 
so that the opportunity would be created for Atlantis to step up and show me what she could do, to show me what I knew she had it in her to do, but she had to prove it to herself. And she did an outstanding job. Well, <clears throat> I continued taking the medication and, and researching um, my health and trying to understand why I was sick because, you know, I'm traditionally been a very healthy person and, and have only been hospitalized three times in my life. I went to see my cardiologist on March the 2nd, and he shared with me uh, some words that shook me to my core. He said, Mr. Browder, you've been on the best medication for congestive heart failure with low ejection fraction, and the needle has not moved in three months. Uh, the medications that we've been treating you with, the tests that we've done, um, uh, we're, we're at a loss to figure out, one, why you're sick, and two, why you're not getting better. And it was at that point that he said that uh, because I also had um, AFib, and let me, let me just take a moment and explain to you what um, congestive heart failure with low ejection fraction really means. Um, it turned out that my left ventricle was inflamed. Uh, the left quadrant, the lower left quadrant of my heart, which pumps the blood out to my body, uh, those, the lining of the heart muscles were inflamed. And as a consequence, my heart wasn't, wasn't pumping enough volume of, of blood out of that chamber into my system so that uh, I could get the proper nourishment and oxygen that my body needed. And, you know, what was interesting is that all of last year, I was feeling out of sorts, but I had attributed that to, to COVID, to long COVID. I've had COVID um, once a year for the past three years. And uh, I thought I was just suffering from long COVID. And I didn't know that the symptoms that I was feeling were attributed to something else. So as a result of my heart not pumping enough blood into my body, my brain was sending signals to my heart to pump more, to pump harder, to pump harder. And as a result of those signals uh, being transferred from my brain to my heart and my heart trying its best, um, I was suffering from, from AFib. Uh, and that is I had an irregular heartbeat because my heart was overworking itself. And uh, again, I didn't know I had AFib until I was hospitalized. But once I was told what those symptoms were, I realized that I had had I had been suffering from AFib throughout most of last year and had no idea. But the doctor told me on March the 2nd that uh, they're stumped. Uh, I didn't have clogged arteries. I didn't have um, other problems associated with congestive heart failure. My ejection fraction numbers, that is the number, the percentage of, of, of blood that my left ventricle pumps out of my heart chamber into my body was initially when I was first at the ER, it was 10%. The normal ejection fraction numbers are between 50 and 70%, and anything below 40 is a cause for concern. So by the time I left the hospital on December the 2nd, my ejection fraction numbers were up to 40%, but that was still uh, below normal. And the medications that I uh, was on should have raised my ejection fraction numbers, but they were still low. So my doctor told me at that meeting, that I should get a defibrillator implant in order to um, attend to the issues associated with my AFib. Because if I have these irregular heartbeats, my heart could stop and the defibrillator would, uh, would shock my heart uh, back into operation. So he recommended that I do that. And then he also suggested that I consider getting a heart transplant. Now, I was 71 years old at the time, and the idea of getting heart transplant at, at my age didn't really sit well with me. So as I sat there and listened to my doctor's prognosis about my health, I asked him a question. I said, Doc, do you think that the 13, 14 years that I spent going in and out of tombs, tombs that are you know, over 2,700 years old, do you think it's possible that I might have picked up uh, an infection or some bacteria or something? And he said, to his credit, he hadn't considered that. He made arrangements for me to meet with an infectious disease specialist. I met with her at the end of the month. She ran a battery of tests. 
and then came back in early April with, um, with the diagnosis. She found that I was suffering from a rare, a very rare bacterial infection known as brucilla. And that in my instance, I had an even rarer form of brucilla um, in, in that it affected my heart muscle. And I was suffering from brucilliosis myocarditis. That is inflammation of my heart muscle caused by this bacterial infection. And based on the literature that, that I was able to access, um, less than 1.2% of people in the world have ever had this infection in the heart muscle. Usually people get it in various organs like the, uh, the kidneys or, or the liver. And it usually uh, masks itself as uh, arthritis. It causes inflammation, which is typically um, uh, misdiagnosed as arthritis. So I had an extremely rare form of this bacterial infection. But my doctor said, the good news is it's treatable with antibiotics. So she set up a regimen for me to do 60 days of antibiotics. The first 10 days, uh, it was I was treated intravenously so that I would have an infusion of this antibiotics that would go directly into my heart to address the, um, the um, inflamed heart muscles. And then I took uh, two antibiotic tablets um, twice a day, uh, or a tablet, one, one tablet twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And I was to do this for 60 days. And uh, I was told that uh, this should clear up the problem and reduce the inflammation of my heart muscle, which should then uh, reduce my uh, AFib and also increase my ejection fraction numbers. So <clears throat> I um, processed all of this. And as I did my research on Brucilla, um, Atlantis was able to find several documents for me that showed that Brucilla essentially runs rapid in Egypt. They've had an epidemic of brucilla for, for decades. There's an article by the NIH that just documents the fact that uh, brucilla has, has been found in practically every location throughout Egypt. What brucilla is, is an infection that is caused by farm animals, primarily cows, goats, and sheep. And it's primarily gotten uh, from people eating uh, the flesh of these animals or drinking their milk. Well, I've been a vegetarian for 45 years and I haven't eaten meat. Uh, I don't drink um, uh, cow's milk. So I had to rule out that as the cause. And my uh, infectious disease specialist said that it is possible for the brucilla bacteria to be transmitted through the air and it could travel a distance of uh, two miles. So as I process, and I also found out that brucilla is a slow acting infection and that sometimes it can lie dormant in your body for about a year before you start feeling the effects. So as I look back over my travels, I realized that the only time I would have been exposed to it uh, would have been in December of um, 2020. Uh, I spent uh, several weeks in Egypt, and um, where I was living, there is a, a small uh, house behind the apartment where we were living, where the owner of that house had three or four cows, so I could have gotten exposure that way. Two doors down from me was another house that had several cows, so it's possible that I might have picked up this bacteria from the cows that were in close proximity to where I was staying. But in any event, um, I didn't begin feeling the effects of this infection until early last year. And as I stated earlier, I thought that I was just suffering from um, long COVID and didn't pay any attention to this until um, I had to go to the ER on November the 27th of last year. So <clears throat> I finished my regimen of antibiotics on June the 22nd. Uh, my doctors uh, gave me a thumbs up and said that I have been responding well to treatment. 
but I was told that they wanted to follow up in uh, about three months just to make sure that all of the, the infection was going from my body. And I was given a clean bit of, bill of health so that I could travel to Egypt with our study tour in July. This past July study tour, our 27th annual uh, study tour at Egypt was beyond a doubt our best study tour ever. We had our largest group, 120 people, uh, we had uh, about 12 different families on that tour. We had families with uh, young children, teenage children, and adult children. We had people who had um, had been reading my books, who had seen my videos on YouTube. And this was a group of people who were physically, financially, mentally, and emotionally prepared to make this trip to Egypt. And as a consequence of all of these things, coalescing together. We had a phenomenal tour, uh, my best to date. And I'm not exaggerating when I when I say that. Well, <clears throat> we turned from that great trip, celebrated uh, my 72nd birthday the day after we got back on the 26th of July. And then in early um, August, I uh, went to take uh, some tests to just so my doctors can monitor how I was doing. I took a PET scan so that they could get a clear picture of my heart and, and, and see how that was doing. And I also took um, another um, electrocardiogram. I got the results a couple of weeks later and the results were mixed. The, the results were good and not so good. The PET scan showed that the inflammation in my heart muscle had been significantly, significantly reduced but the electrocardiogram uh, showed that my ejection fraction numbers had dropped considerably. Now I had uh, another uh, electrocardiogram done in, in June while I was still on the antibiotics and it showed a 70% improvement in my ejection fraction numbers. In other words, my ejection fraction numbers had jumped from 20 in March to 36 in June. I took the test again in August and it showed my ejection fraction numbers had decreased back to 26. So it was a conundrum. Um, nobody could understand why my um, heart function was getting better, but I still had AFib and I had a diminished ejection fraction. So um, we're still trying to, we were still trying to figure that out. And, and I felt, I felt, you know, because I know my body, I've been living in it all my life. And I felt that, that I still had the infection. So it took me a while to get my doctors to schedule another blood test, which I did last Wednesday on the 13th. And I finally got the results of that blood test back at two o'clock this morning. And the blood test showed that I, I still have traces of this infection. Um, and so I'm waiting for my doctors to determine what my next steps would be. Uh, do I get back on antibiotics to, to address this issue? Um, and the other concern that they expressed to me was that it's quite possible that some of the damage that was done to my heart while I had the infection might be permanent and that I might, may just have to live with this for the rest of my life. So I'm waiting for the next series of tests that will determine you know, my, my heart condition, and that in turn will affect everything that I do. So one of the things that I can say uh, on this day, the 20th of September, 2023, one of the things that I can say uh, without a doubt is that my days of digging in tombs are over. I'm going to have to focus my attention on my health, my heart health, and that uh, I'm fortunate, I'm blessed that we have been able to uh, secure funding so that the work in Egypt can continue. And hopefully, it's my hope, it's my desire that uh, the tombs can still open on time in 2025. So what does that mean? It means, as I process everything that I've been dealing with, it means to me <clears throat> that while I can't continue to participate in the excavation in Egypt, it means that it's time for me to bring the ASA Restoration Project home. 
it's time for me to use the knowledge gained um, from 14 years of working in Egypt, 14 years of accessing information that has literally allowed us to rewrite the history of the 25th dynasty and also correct some of the errors of the earlier periods in comedic history. And so I'm gonna be doing that work here in the United States, here in Washington, DC. And so what's significant is the Ace of Restoration Project will be 15 years old tomorrow. And when this project was created, we had two primary goals. The first was to fund the excavations in Luxor and to specifically document the Kushite presence in Kemet. And we have done that. And we've done a remarkable job that, have ex that has exceeded our wildest expectations. Our second goal was to preserve the legacy of Dr. Asa G. Hilliard III. And I cannot think of a better way to honor Asa's legacy than to take the information that we've acquired and make it accessible to our communities here in DC, here in Maryland, um, here in the United States, and make this information available in the form of publications, presentations, curriculum, and documentaries. This is something that I can do uh, at home. Uh, this is something that I can do working in concert with other people here. So what we're talking about essentially is the domestic application of the ACER Restoration Project. Bringing that information, bringing those resources home and using them where they are needed at this particular point in time in US history. So I wanna share with you some of the projects that are associated with the ACER Restoration Project that are currently in our timeline. One of the projects that we'll be sharing with you very soon is the uh, Renoko Rashidi documentary. As you all know, Renoko passed in Egypt two years ago on August the uh, 2nd in 2021. And as we work to bring his body, Renoko's body back from Egypt, have it transported uh, to LA, we work to organize his funeral, uh, we feel, and we're currently working with his family to institutionalize his work. Uh, we're helping them secure a, a, a college or university that will receive all of Renoko's uh, books, his publications, his photographs, and make that available in their archives to scholars, to students, to interested parties all over the world. That's in progress right now. And this documentary will help to illuminate the brilliance of Renoko Rashidi to the hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who only heard about him after he died. Um, we also have a new publication uh, that, um, that came out um, several weeks ago uh, called a publication called Jelani's Key. And uh, uh, Brother Amari Jackson uh, wrote that book uh, Brother Jackson also was responsible for writing the screenplay for the Renoko Rashidi documentary. And this publication, Jelani's Key, is a coming of age story for young black males. And um, the two main characters in the book are two 11 year old uh, black boys who have a rite of passage, so to speak. And during their rite of passage, they learn about their ancestors uh, one boy's father, another boy's uh, grandfather, who as younger men had traveled to Egypt and visited the tomb of Karaka men. So these young boys are learning about African history and they're learning about Karaka men in this publication. And what Brother Amari has done in his effort to support the work of the Ace of Restoration Project, he is uh, has graciously, graciously agreed to uh, donate 25% of the proceeds from the sale of this book, Jelani Key to the Ace of Restoration Project. Another project in the pipeline is the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project, which we began a number of years ago, but has been on hold because of COVID. Uh, that project is going to be housed in the uh, Thurgood Marshall Center, uh, where the IKG Cultural Resource Center has been housed for the past 17 years. That project will be unveiled, will be completed, in the spring of next year. And hand in hand with that project is a African and African-American history curriculum uh, that Atlantis and I have already written uh, 
Uh, we developed this curriculum two years ago for um, high school students in Fresno, California. It's now available statewide. We're going to modify that curriculum and make it available as a component of the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project. Uh, another project that we will um, reactivate, reintroduce, a project that I have been working on for a decade in California when I would go out monthly to do a, um, presentations with a group of African-American high school students in San Jose, California. Uh, and we nationalized that program and called it the Cultural Imperative Program or CIP. Atlantis has been partnering with me uh, for the last several years on that project. She has written an outstanding curriculum where high school students are reading essays in From the Browder File and they're writing uh, reflection papers and we're teaching them their history. Uh, as a matter of fact, you all recall on a Wisdom Wednesday program several months ago, our dear brother uh, Quayley did a presentation on the um, his PhD work, which was a longitudinal study done on this work, where we have proven the efficacy of introducing African-American children, African-American students to African history as a young a at, at, a, at a young age, which has transformed their, their interest in school. It has had a impact on uh, how they see themselves. It has had an impact on their grades and their function in their household and in their community. So all of this information has been documented and it honors the work, it honors the legacy of Dr. Hilliard. And um, the last thing that's in the pipeline is a third volume of uh, the Browder file a forthcoming publication entitled Why Kemet Matters. So let me um, return to uh, my, my screen, my PowerPoint for a minute, and just share with you some, some videos, uh, short video clips that document each of these forthcoming projects. And the very first piece that I'll share with you is um, the trailer for the Renoka Rashidi documentary. Are you screen up? Mm -hmm. Are you sharing your you need to share your your screen? I can't hear you, Lantis. Share your screen. I didn't share it. There was no. a time of you. All right. Sorry. Uh let me get out of here. Uh my daughter, my right hand woman, just reminded me that I didn't share my screen. So let me go back and let me share my screen and we will start this once again. Uh, let me go back. And did you click share sound? Uh, that should be already preset, share the sound. So I think we should be good to go. Uh, but let me know. Can you hear everything? Okay, good. Thank you. Again, this is the trailer for the Renoka Rashidi uh, documentary which we had the pleasure of um, showcasing in California last month. We shared this documentary with uh, Renoko's family, and uh, we look forward- There was a time if you called me an African, yeah. you better be ready to fight. Because that was the most low down, dirty, insulting insult you could give me. But if you call me an African now, I'll never leave your side. We're friends forever, because that is a tremendous compliment. But I had to find out who I was. Many of the ills facing black America stem from the lack of knowledge about the true history concerning Americans of African descent. A history that began way before the Mayflower and is inclusive of the great civilizations and cultures which populated the African continent. As a result, Africa and all things African have been and continue to be devalued at best and at worst excluded from the conversation altogether. Attacking this value deficit was the mission of the late Dr. Renoko Rashidi. And I can honestly say that I haven't unpacked a suitcase uh, completely since about 1997-98. Um, in the last few years, uh, 
I remember a few years ago, I actually visited 27 countries in one calendar year. And since 1998, I've been blessed to visit 103 countries. And it's just changed my life dramatically. I've learned a lot. And mostly what I've learned about is myself. Dr. Renoko Rashidi was a world traveler who spent three decades traveling to over 125 countries. Because that was such a rare thing for a black scholar to travel extensively like he did. Studying, chronicling, and lecturing on the migration and presence of African people throughout the world. He was obsessed with documenting what I refer to as the positive portrayal of the worldwide African experience. He in awe with his brilliance and his unwavering commitment to African people. There's a consistent thread that goes through Renoka Rashid, and that being his commitment to African people, his love of African people, his desire to see African people be better. On August 2nd, 2021, Dr. Renoko Rashidi transitioned in Egypt to walk no more in the earthly realm, but to walk among the ancestors, knowing that when it came to his people, he fulfilled his purpose and his job was well done. He now walks among the ancestors. We're going to have a screening of this documentary in D.C. Uh, and in Houston next month. And plans are currently underway to make this documentary available in cities throughout the United States. So if anyone is interested in organizing a screening in your city, uh, please make that information available to us. And we have, we'll have our team reach out to you. The next uh, short trailer I want to share with you is one for Jelani's Key. And you can see the work of uh, D. Amari Jackson. Okay. Let's move forward. Celestial canvas, amidst rich African sands, in the nave of mighty Kemet, near royal burial lands, I remember my long lost brother, the temple he lies within, and face Karak Amen, whose spirit now speaks again. From the mind of Diamari Jackson, Jelani's key. Uh, Jelani's Key can be purchased online. Um, Brother uh, Amari Jackson will be in D.C. He will be participating in the screening of Renoko's documentary on the 27th of October. And the following day, on the 28th, he will have a, uh, a book signing at Sankofa uh, Video and Books. So we'll have more information about those two activities in the coming weeks. And now the next piece I'll share with you is a trailer for the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project, which is my response to um, some of the information in the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, so this project is one that is near and dear to my heart and one that I'm sure you all will love. So let me share that trailer with you. One of the most important takeaways from viewing the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project and taking the Egypt on the Potomac field trip and visiting the National Museum of African American History and Culture is the importance of remembering and honoring our ancestors. Our ancestors are the bridges which link the past, present, and future. The ancestors are not dead. They live with us every day. The streets we walk on, the buildings we walk through, were built by ancestors. The songs we sing, 
the books we read, the traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation were written by ancestors long gone. The dead are not dead. They live in us. We carry them in our DNA. And all that is required for us to do is acknowledge them, call their names, and allow them to inspire us to do our best work. In the beginning, our ancestors knew not. They studied. For 4,000 years, they learned all there was to know, and they taught others. For 1,000 years, they spread their wisdom from the Nile to the Niger. Then came the Ma'afa, the great disaster. Enslavers made it illegal for Africans to read and write. They were forced to forget all they had learned and taught. They built America from the Hudson to the Potomac to the Mississippi and beyond. After 400 years of forgetting, they forgot that they had forgotten. That changes today. I will remember for them. I will read for them. I will write for them. I will speak for them and teach for them. I will make certain that they are never forgotten again. For I am the vessel through which my ancestors live, breathe, and do their best work. So the question then becomes, how do we ensure that this knowledge, this desire to want to know who we are as people of African ancestry is passed down to successive generations? That is the work of the Cultural Imperative Program. And I'm really pleased to say that Atlantis has really taken the lead in taking this project to the next level. So let me share with you uh, the trailer for the Coach Imperative Program, which was cut short because of COVID, but we're currently in the process of reactivating this program. And in talking to Atlantis, uh, we have decided that we have to move beyond just working with high school students. We want to be able to make this information accessible to the parents uh, the adults in the household with these students so that the entire family can learn about who they are together for the benefit of families and communities. So here's a, uh, a trailer for CIP. This moment is here, I can't believe it. It's been a long journey. Mr. Brower has done a, a lot of amazing work up and said, I, I don't want this generation to have to wait until they're 60 to learn what all you Broward scholars have learned. And so she said to Mr. Broward, do you do anything with young people? So the time that you all spent reading the Broward file, reading the essays in the Broward file, and writing the reflection papers, that time was designed specifically to undo all the efforts to destroy your mind. And what I want you all to, to understand during the two and a half days that we have is that here in D.C., the most powerful nation on the face of this planet was a city that was built by the descendants of the same hands that built the pyramid. The same hands that built the pyramid is built the Capitol, built the White House, built the Washington Monument. And nowhere in D.C. is there anything that denotes what our ancestors So. Your salvation, our salvation, lies in us knowing who we are and affirming that within us so that we can use the resources that we have available to us to empower us. And that's what this weekend is all about. We put this libation in honor of our ancient ancestors, mothers and fathers who were the parents of humanity, culture, and civilization. We acknowledge them for existing and we say, Ashe. Ashe. So if we don't tell our story, nobody else will. Atlantis will be providing more details about the forthcoming CIP program. And the program is, is set up such that it could be operational in any city in the United States, any city in the world. The next trailer, uh, uh, nowhere, that was our last trailer, but I want to share with you some forthcoming publications. Browder File uh, 3, Volume 3 is in the works. 
It will free minds and blow minds as well. There's also a new publication uh, published by Ben. Uh, it's designed specifically for educators to help empower them with the knowledge and skills necessary to be able to teach African history, um, African American history in the classroom. I have a, a article in this particular publication that speaks to the work that we've been doing here in Washington, D.C. And then winding up, um, I've done, <clears throat> I've done what, six or seven interviews on the Rock Newman Show since, um, gosh, uh, 2018, 2017, 2018, I believe. And my very first interview on the Rock Newman Show, where I talked about religion, the African origins of Christianity specifically, that particular show has over one and a half million views. That particular show has been responsible for introducing Tony Browder and the work of IKG to millions of people all around the world. I got together with Rock um, last uh, Monday, and uh, we are going to be uh, taping another interview uh, this coming Friday. And I guarantee you that interview will be my best interview ever. So look forward to that soon. Rock Newman's new show is called Rock Newman 2.0. So uh, look for that coming soon. And um, I mentioned on Friday, October the 27th, we're going to have a special screening of the Renoko Rashidi documentary. Uh, we'll post all of this information on our website. You can go to Eventbrite right now and purchase your tickets uh, for this event. In addition to the screening, that will be followed by a panel discussion uh, featuring several participants from the documentary, uh, uh, Senghor Bay, uh, Atlantis Browder, uh, Zama Cook, Paul Coates, Diamari Jackson, and I will moderate that discussion. And we will also have uh, a screening of this documentary in Houston uh, the Friday before on Friday, October the 13th. More details about that will be available uh, soon. So um, all of this speaks to, uh, and let me stop my share. All of this speaks to uh, the fourth coming work of um, the ASA Restoration Project, the domestic application of the ASA Restoration Project. So it's time for us to bring our attention um, and, and our funds back home because as, as all of you all know, um, African-centered education, African education, um, African-American education is under attack in this country. So we have to take care of home first before we go around the world to try to, to liberate other people. Because I understand very clearly that what we do, what African-Americans do impacts the world. I saw that in the 60s. I remember the impact of the African Center movement in the late 80s and early 90s. And, and so we're at an inflection point in American history and world history. And it's important that voices, our voices are not silent. It's important that we train the next generation that will replace us and provide them with accurate information that will help them continue to make this knowledge available to future generations. And that's what I'm committed to. So there's one more issue I want to discuss before I close and take your questions. And um, that has to do with our plans for 2025. I know you all are saying, well, look, Tony, if you're not going to be participating in the archaeological excavations in Egypt anymore, uh, what's going to happen with the plans for 2025? Well, I'm sure all of you all are aware of what's been happening in Egypt uh, just this year alone uh, with the cancellation of the Kevin Hart uh, concert in February of this year, with the cancellation of the Travis Scott concert in January of this year with all of the negative press regarding the uh, Netflix documentary on Cleopatra. So there has been a, a growing anti-African or Afrocentric um, trend in Egypt that is, is very disturbing. And, and, and so I don't have control over 
how people in Egypt respond to me, respond to the work that we do. But I do have control over how people respond to this information here at home in Washington, D.C. and the United States of America. So to that end, I know it would be foolish of me to attempt to move forward with our plans to have our grand opening activities uh, in Egypt. It would be foolish of me to um, have the planned concert of Earth, Wind & Fire at the Giza Pyramids because it could be too easily taken down by people who disagree with, with, with my philosophy. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. And so what I've decided to do is to bring those activities home, to bring them specifically here to Washington, D.C. So we are currently uh, looking to secure a venue for our 2025 Cometamorphosis Conference, where we'll have a gathering of people who have traveled to Kemet with us over the decades. And that three-day event will conclude with a concert slash fundraiser featuring Earth, Wind & Fire. I've already been in contact with, uh, with their team and they're st still willing to work with us. And they're pleased that we're bringing this activity home to DC. So we're gonna bring our people, we're gonna bring our money, right here in DC. So we'll be sharing details with you um, about that 2025 event. Once we have secured the venue, we'll give you all the details on the upcoming conference and everything else that will be a part of that event. And that's just a, a teaser of what's coming with the domestic application of the ASA Restoration Project. So these are some of our plans for the next two years. And with your continued support of IKG, with your continued support of the ASA Restoration Project and with the guidance of our ancestors, we will achieve all of these goals and so much more. So with that, I will formally bring my remarks to a close and I'll turn the floor back over to you, Adjua, so that we can take some questions. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Baba, uh, so as you just shared, we are going to begin taking questions. So please begin typing your questions in the Q&A box and we will uh, get started with a few that we already have here. So first question, phenomenal program tonight. Any plans on teaching another master class? Uh, yeah, I've, um, I've thought about that. I have received uh, numerous um, emails from people who are just discovering me, who've just read a Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, a book which is 30 years old. And uh, people want to, um, to study under me. And I feel an obligation and a commitment to cultivate uh, the same, uh, a similar relationship with, with folk as I cultivated with, with Asa Hilliard, with John Henry Clark, with uh, Dr. Welsey and, and, and Dr. Newton and so many other scholars. Uh, but my first priority is my health. Uh, that's number one, because without your health, you cannot do anything. Uh, so I want to be able to plan some activities and I ask, give me a little time. Let me get on the other side of this health situation. Uh, I already have some projects in the pipeline so they are going to uh, take a, a considerable amount of my time as well. I've got to finish writing um, from the Browder File, Volume 3, get it edited. Uh, so I've got some things on my plate already. I'm not going to overtax myself. But once I have cleared some of these items off my plate, uh, I will look at setting some time frames to uh, do another master class. And thank you for that question. Awesome. Uh, another question, speaking of Egypt, will you uh, still be doing the tours in December? I know there's a December tour coming up. So a person want to know, are those uh, tours still happening? And another person asks, are they open to novices? So maybe talk a little bit about sure. that. Uh, yes, uh, we do have plans currently for our next tour to Egypt. Our uh, Sacred Landscape of Ancient Egypt Study Tour, which takes place December the 14th through the 24th of this year. There's still slots available for anyone who's interested. 
as long as I am physically able to continue doing the tours, I will, and has already been demonstrated by Atlantis. If I'm not able to do it, she's able to step in and do the study tours. And as I've been telling Atlantis for years, she's already, she's better than I am. Uh, she's smarter than I am uh, in that her brain is younger and the neurons fire better. I just happen to be um, wiser than she is because I've lived longer. I have more experiences to draw upon. But Atlantis is going to be a major game changer. And, and I want you all to keep your eyes out uh, on her. Uh, she's in a position to take everything that her father has done to the next level. And that's going to happen. The uh, and We also are still planning to continue with our um, summer tours in July. Uh, we're waiting to finalize the pricing on the airfare so that we can post our 2024 study tour. That is going to happen. And um, the study tours are set up such that the summer tour is a 15-day study tour with the Nile cruise. We get to see all the major sites in Egypt. The December tour is primarily marketed towards people who have traveled to Egypt before. Why is that? That's because on the December tour, it's a shorter trip. It's only 10 days as opposed to 15 days. And we don't travel to all of the sites that we would see during the summer. We don't go to, to Aswan. We don't go to Abyssinia. We don't go to Edfu and Kamumbo. We focus primarily, we spend time in Giza and Saqqara, and we'll also visit the new museum, the Grand Egyptian Museum, which is scheduled to open in November. Let us pray. Um, but um, the December tour focuses primarily on Luxor. Luxor is where I've had the pleasure and the honor of spending serious time digging in the West Bank, moving around in the West Bank, gaining greater familiarity with the sacred landscape of Luxor. Luxor, for over a thousand years, served as the cultural, political, and spiritual capital of Kemet. By extension, it was the cultural, political, and spiritual capital of the world for over a thousand years. The East Bank and the West Bank of Luxor, the East Bank and West Bank of the Nile River in Luxor, is where a sacred landscape was created that connects the living with the ancestors. And I understand that better now than at any point in my life. You know, working in this tomb and going in and out of these tombs over the past 14 years has helped me to understand what our ancestors, uh, what our Kushite ancestors specifically understood. And they knew that there is no such thing as death. Uh, they knew how to prepare a sacred space where the living would have access to their ancestors. These concepts are literally carved in stone, and it's simply a matter of cultivating the, the ability to interpret what is there. So the December tours are designed specifically to focus on that aspect of Nile Valley civilization. And the highlight of the December tour is the winter solstice sunrise celebration at Karnak Temple, the largest temple complex in the world. You'll have an opportunity to see the sun rise down the central axis of Karnak Temple and illuminate the Holy of Holies, which was the sacred abode of Amen, the unseen presence of God Almighty. So this trip is a shorter trip. It is focused primarily on Luxor. And so I make the distinction between the December trip and the summer trip because uh, we don't visit all the sites. So I don't want people come to, to come to our December trip and become disappointed because we don't go to Abyssinia. We don't visit some of the other sites. But uh, that being said, that uh, should not prevent you from coming if you want to experience uh, the sacred landscape of, uh, of Waset, the sacred landscape of Egypt. So that opportunity is available to you if you choose to take advantage of it. And uh, who knows what else is in the future for us in the coming um, months and years. All right. Speaking of the tombs and the discoveries, uh, two questions related to that. Cheryl would like to know, will you write a book documenting all of your Egyptian discoveries of the tombs from your knowledge? And then AJ asked, um, what key questions about the tombs would you love to see addressed 
by the next generation? Well, uh, actually, I've got three or four books that I can write, uh, not only about the tombs, but about what I've learned about Egypt. Uh, you know, after 66 trips, um, I see this ancient civilization through entirely different eyes. I have a greater understanding and appreciation for the mind that created these monuments. And while most of us fixate on the pyramids and the Sphinx, um, those structures are important, but the most important structures to me are the structures in, um, in Waset uh, or modern day Luxor, Karnak Temple, Luxor Temple, and the Valley of the Kings, Queens and Nobles. There's a whole level of knowledge uh, that I have not seen very many people write about or talk about. And because of my background in design and architecture uh, and my background in art, I see all of this history, all of this architecture uh, through a different lens. And that has been my gift. You know, I write as an artist. Uh, I research as an artist. That's my formal training. I'm not an Egyptologist. I'm not an archaeologist, but I've done these things because these are things that I was literally born in this lifetime to do. But I want to be able to share these thoughts and these experiences in a number of different books and a number of different presentations. So you're going to be seeing my best work over the course of the next four or five years. And one of the other things that I've been giving thought to is to do a, a picture book. I've got, you know, I've got some phenomenal photographs that can uh, tell a story of our history much better than words can. As, as the Chinese said, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I've got thousands of pictures, like Renoko, thousands of pictures that uh, need to be shared in order to help uh, us get a better understanding of this great culture and civilization. So to the other question, about uh, what could future uh, archaeologists gain from our experiences. Uh, we've uncovered a lot in Luxor, but I found that there is a wealth of information in Sudan that is waiting to be uncovered. There's a wealth of information in Ethiopia that is waiting to be uncovered, uh, and Kenya as well. I've been in communication with people in Uganda who want me to come down and work with them to uh, help expand their museum and do some research. So I would love to be able to have a host of people following my footsteps, following Atlantis's footsteps and assume responsibility or cultivate a profound love and interest in wanting to know more about our history and culture and being able to accurately interpret that information. And that's key because there's so much misinformation um, about Nile Valley culture and civilization. There's so much misinformation about African-American history and culture. There's so much information on the internet that it it makes me sick. And, and that comes from, uh, from our folk as well as other folk. Uh, and I realize that uh, not everybody is going to be on, on board with us, but we have the capacity and the duty to reach as many people as possible. And given what's happening right now in this country with the efforts to shut down the teaching of, of, of the history of enslavement here in the United States, to shut down the teaching of uh, critical race theory, to shut down discussions about the experiences of, of African-Americans in this country, uh, we need to uh, stop getting upset when people want to ban the teaching of our history in classrooms we need to make our homes our classroom. We need to make our barbershops and our beauty shops our classrooms. We need to have our churches open their doors so that this information could be taught. We need to have, um, we need to have uh, our CIP program in, in cities all around the world. So we are doing our part to make this information uh, available to as many people as possible. That was the mission of of IKG when I founded this company in 1982. We have not deviated from that mission. What we need to do is amplify our numbers. I'm very clear that not everybody's gonna get it. Not everybody's gonna be in lock, lockstep with us. That's unrealistic, but we can increase our numbers and teach people how to read, how to study, 
how to comprehend what they've read and study, and how to articulate this information to their family and friends and to the world. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. And I invite all interested parties to stay in contact with us and to support our work so that we can work collectively to achieve these goals. Great, and to answer um, a couple of questions about tonight's program, all of our Wisdom Wednesday programs are on our IKG YouTube page. So yes, tonight's program will, is being recorded and will be available on YouTube. Um, speaking of some of the controversy going on with um, our history and people wanting to minimize it, two questions related to that. Cheryl first asked, since there is an anti-Black movement growing in Egypt, does that mean they will destroy or diminish the work of the 25th dynasty? And then along those lines, Brother Passar asked, can you briefly comment on the controversy around the Netflix documentary on Cleopatra? Well, um, a brief critique. let me be honest with you. <clears throat> Tourism is the engine which sustains the economic engine, which sustains Egypt. And I would think that um, the opening of these 25th dynasty tombs will be um, a major game changer for Egypt. Uh, there will be hundreds of thousands of people who will want to see these magnificent tombs. Karakamin's tomb is four times larger than King Tut's tomb. Uh, it's an architectural and a literary masterpiece and we've done a remarkable job. Our team has done a remarkable job in restoring this, this, this uh, temple tomb. So uh, I'm not worried about, uh, about that. I also um, understand that, um, and I can't go into a lot of details now, but I also understand that much of the uh, anti-African uh, or anti-Afrocentric sentiments in Egypt all a byproduct of ignorance. Um, people have believed the lies that have been told about us, that we were nothing but slaves. And that's why I started that, that the, the slide with Asa, with um, him saying, whatever you do, don't allow them to begin our history in slavery. History is just a blip, as I, as, a, as I have said, with regards to the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project. If the story of African people were a book of a thousand pages, the story of our enslavement begins on page 996 and is only two pages long. So our work, the work of the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project, the work of the ASA Restoration Project, the work of IKG, is to document and tell the story of the first 995 pages of African people. And that story is clear. The giants who preceded me documented that. They wrote those stories, but they aren't available to the general public. So I know for a fact that once that information is made available to more people, then people of all ethnicities, people of all cultures will speak up. And the, the anti-African sentiments that have been um, rearing their ugly heads in Egypt is not unlike the anti-African sentiments that we see right here in, in, in DC, right here in the United States of America. So the world has been brainwashed into believing that people of African ancestry have no history, have no culture, and that is a lie. Uh, that lie can be refuted with scientific and historical evidence. That evidence has been intentionally tamped down and withheld from the general public. And it's my job to live the rest of my life making sure that this information is accessible to as many people as possible. And I can't do this work by myself. Every person uh, watching this program this evening has an obligation. If you love your children, if you love your family, if you love your community, you have an obligation to know more about your personal family history, to know more about our collective historical and cultural history, and make sure that your friends, your family members, your fraternity members, your sorority members, the people in your clubs and, and in the barbershop and beauty shop, your church, know this information. We have to do what, what our ancestors did in the 40s, 50s, and 60s when this information wasn't available in school systems. We made sure that our children learned this information. So we've got to go back 
to those time frames. Uh, and that's that's Sankofa to go back and reclaim the knowledge of the past. We don't have to go back a thousand years or two thousand years. Let's go back fifty years, grab the knowledge, the successes and the failures of the past, learn that information and apply it to today and the future so that we can change the trajectory of our lives. That to me is the greatest expression of freedom. And if you don't know how to do that, if you don't want to do that, you're not free. You're just wasting air. So we're reaching a critical point in American history and world history where we are running out of time to get things right. We're running out of time and so I want to make sure that that I do everything within my power to do as Dr. Wilson encouraged us to do, and that is to fulfill our cosmic assignment. I know why I'm, why I'm here. I know what I'm supposed to do with my life, and I have been doing it for most of my life and will, con will continue to do it until my life is done. Everybody has a similar mission. Find that mission and spend your time and energy fulfilling your global assignment, your cosmic assignment. Renoko did it. And that's why, you know, we produced this documentary. I've been in talks with several people about doing a documentary on Now Valley Contributions to Civilization uh, and doing several other uh, projects that will get our message out to a wider audience. And, you know, we are going to have to fund these projects because major organizations and, and institutions aren't going to do that. So this point, let me close on this point, and then I'd like to bring Atlantis in so that she can spend a few minutes talking about our CIP program. Everybody in Egypt knows that African-American tourists spend more money than anybody else. More specifically, African-American females spend more money as tourists in Egypt than anybody else. We are a cash cow. Everybody knows it. Generally speaking, I was listening to an interview on the Carl Nelson show with Dennis Kimbrough, and he he essentially repeated the same thing, but he applied that knowledge to the United States of America. Every business person knows that African-American females spend more money on clothes, on cosmetics, on, on getting their hair done, on, on a whole host of things. We spend more money on these things than any other people. So it's time we start investing that money in ourselves. Instead of making other people wealthy, we need to make ourselves wealthy by expanding our knowledge base. Your health and your knowledge are your greatest wealth. So we need to understand that because time is running out. There is a very good chance that 45 might become 47. And when that happens, <laughs> Uh, you're going to be up the creek without a paddle. So now is not the time to sit on the fence. Now is not the time to be uh, complaining. Now is not the time to be afraid. Now is the time for action. And if you're not willing to commit yourself to something bigger than your own individual life, then you need to just get out of the way so that others can do the work. So if we can, um, Adjua, bring Atlantis on board so that she can talk briefly about the um, CIP program and then uh, if we have time, we can take a few more questions and close out at nine. All right. Thank you, Dad. And good evening, family. Um, well, Dad, I think you gave a pretty good overview of CIP, but I'll share a few more details. And I'll also drop in the chat uh, the link that will share a little bit more information about the process to apply for CIP um, to bring that to your city. Uh, but CIP, the Cultural Imperative Program, is a Saturday program uh, geared towards high school students. And in the program, uh, students meet one Saturday a month between January and May. And during these sessions, students will, re uh, will read select articles and from the broader file, and they will complete activities that are a part of the curriculum that I developed a few years ago. And so um, their participation in the program allows them to dig deeper um, with regards to learning more and analyzing information about African American, uh, African and African American history. But most importantly, it creates a safe space. Um, to have these conversations with our young people. So uh, we plan to roll C CIP out 
uh, in just a few months. But if you uh, check out the link that I'm going to place in the chat, it'll give you uh, more information about the timeline when applications are due um, and everything that is involved. And I'll also place my email in the chat. So if anyone is interested or has any additional questions about CIP, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, uh, 9.54, we have um, time for a few more questions. So um, share any questions you have for me, Sister Adjua. Okay, um, quick question, what's the cat's name? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is my, where she go? Oh, there she is. Oh, yeah, yeah, she that's uh, like... Kashta, uh... <laughs> uh, that's Kashta. Uh, and that's my name, give all of our cats um, African names, uh, names associated with um, African countries. So this is Kasha. Uh, before Kasha, we had Kenya. Before Kenya, we had Kemet. So uh, I love cats. They are um, doorways to the spirit world. And Kasha is always here whenever I'm doing a presentation. She's always here to, to look over my shoulder and make sure that I do it right. So thank you, kitty cat. Appreciate All it. All right, Kasha. Thank you, Kasha. <laughs> So here's a question from Aquia. She was um, asking if you could please speak on your upcoming book about the symbolism in the African American Museum. And on that note, um, speaking of you know, our history here in America, someone also um, inquired about the Egypt on Potomac field trips. So if you can talk about those two things. Sure, sure, sure. Well, the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project allows us the opportunity to expand on our Egypt on the Potomac um, presentation, our Egypt on the Potomac field trip. Uh, those field trips run generally from uh, March through December, uh, excuse me, March through November. So we've got two field trips remaining for this season. Uh, and then our 2023 season will come to an end. When our season begins in March of 24, we will have the, the installation of the John Henry Clark up. We, we, we're changing all of the uh, the visuals that we currently have on the second floor of the Thurgood Marshall Center. We have uh, approximately 400 square feet of wall space in which we will document the, the work that uh, Dr. Clark advanced throughout his life, history and culture and science and philosophy. Uh, and then we also will update the images uh, that are part of our Egypt on the Potomac activities. And we're adding to the Egypt on the Potomac activity information on the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. It's a phenomenal building with phenomenal history. And there is symbolism incorporated within the architecture of that building that tells a different story. So just as I brought my artistic and architectural eye to e examining and documenting Egypt on the Potomac, I've also brought the same attention to examining the architecture and the symbolism of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So that's another book project that's in the works, along with the curriculum to, to go along with the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project. So Atlantis and I are going to be very busy getting these projects out. And uh, we just ask you to, to be patient. And when they come out, uh, to support those projects, uh, to bring people to D.C. for our grand opening of the John Henry Clark Enhanced History Project and our new and expanded uh, Egypt on the Potomac activities. And all of these events are leading up to um, 2025. Uh, we're going we're gonna to throw down in 2025. And on a very basic and fundamental level, I'm looking for 2025 to be my swan song of, of sorts in that I would never retire, but I need to shift gears and, and turn, turn uh, the reins over to people that I know, uh, love and trust, and people with whom I will be confident that they would take all of these projects, all of this work into the next level. Uh, I can't do everything. I'm not gonna try to do everything. Uh, I look to step back at some point in time in the very near future and spend the rest of my life um, traveling and writing. So, um, you know, I'm going to give myself at least um, eight more years so that uh, by the time I'm 80, I could be in semi-retirement semi and do a little bit more of what I want to do. So those are my plans. And I want you all to know that I could not have done 
all the things that I've done through IKG over the past 41 years without your support. And we have done incredible things. We have made history on multiple levels and there's so much more that we will do. And with your continued support, uh, you will be a part of that such that 100 years from now, 200, 500 years from now, when people are looking at the events of the first um, century of the 21st century, um, they will be pleased at what we've done. When your descendants read about what you've done, when they hear stories about what you've done, then they will be proud to carry your name into the future. And when they gather, they will pour libation and they will call your name so that your spirit will come to them. And through that activity, they will come to understand what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there is no death, that we live, we live in our descendants, uh, we are embedded in their DNA, with the proper training and understanding, it is possible to access those ancestors and those ancestral memories. That is what was done throughout the Nile Valley, not just in Kemet, but throughout the entire Nile Valley. And when those people moved from the East to the West, to West Africa, they brought that cargo of knowledge with them. Dr. Finch in his book, Nile Valley Civilization, a 10,000 year history documents that migration. Sheikh Antijab and Teofilo Binga wrote about that, and provided evidence to show that there were at least six migrations from the Nile to the Niger. And then ultimately Africans moved or were stolen from the Niger and brought to the Americas, brought to the Potomac, brought to the Hudson, brought to the Mississippi and beyond. That's our story. And we need to be able to tell that story and tell it with pride because we know that that story does not begin in slavery, it begins with the first human beings on the planet, it began with the oldest and longest documented history of any people on the planet. And that's a story that we have to tell and we have to ensure that that story is told correctly. So with that, I wanna thank you all so much for your time, uh, devotion and attention. And Sister Adjua, I will turn the floor over to you. Yes. Uh, Baba Tony, let me first just say thank you, thank you, thank you, of course, for a wonderful presentation, and most importantly for me, for being such a wonderful Jagna. I really appreciate your words earlier. I've known of you ooh, for now 30 years, and when I was in high school, um, one of the books, I was in the study group, believe it or not, and one of our books was Now Valley Contribution to Civilization, totally blew my mind. Oh, I learned so much and it shaped me. It shaped me. And then to think that less than what five or six years later, I would meet you and, and, and come to have this wonderful uh, partnership with you. I'm so thankful and honored that you trust me with Wisdom Wednesday. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your diligence, your hard work, your wisdom. Thank you for saying yes to us. Thank you for saying yes. You're welcome. You're the, welcome. Um, and I want to invite you all to our next Wisdom Wednesday, which will take place virtually October 18th, featuring um, Friends of the Congo for the Break the Silence Week. Someone asked, will Wisdom Wednesday be back in person? We're not sure yet. Um, the virtual space just gives us more opportunity to reach more people. And so we want to continue doing that. So again, thank you all for coming out. We look forward to seeing you next month. Please go to IKGCulturalResourceCenter.com to learn more about our programming, including the Egypt on the Potomac field trips where you can sign up and purchase tickets and the um, Egypt summer study tours, as well as the December tour, and of course, Wisdom Wednesday, and to purchase any items and books. We look forward to seeing you. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your September and happy Equinox.
Tony, uh, fall equinox is coming. Yes. Yes, the fall equinox is. Um, close out. Can you close <laughs> out on that note? <laughs> uh, the fall equinox is this Saturday, and I had written the time down. It's about two fifty something in the morning, and the equinox is is a time of year. It's two times a year we experience the equinox where we have twelve hours of daylight, twelve hours of nighttime. It's the shifting of the Earth on its axis. It's the shifting of the energy where the days begin to get shorter. And we're moving into a time of darkness, which is symbolic of us going inside, which is symbolic of us cultivating our, our unconscious thoughts, going inside and communicating with the ancestors and inviting them to, to be with us, to provide light in this time of darkness. And the highlight of the, the fall equinox comes on the winter solstice. And we will be in Luxor, Egypt, on the 21st of December to witness the time frame when the earth then shifts on its axis. We will experience the time when the sun is still for four days. And then after that fourth day on December the 25th, the sun will be born and we will move towards another period of more and more light. And light is a metaphor for knowledge, for information, opportunities for growth, and an opportunity to connect with um, with AI. Mm -hmm. I refer to AI as ancestral intelligence. Yes. Those ancestors are all around us and they are just waiting for us to acknowledge them and receive them so they can work through us. Mm -hmm. That's the only AI that you need to concern yourself yes. with. There we go. There we go. Wonderful. As I said, Ashe, thank you, Baba Tony. Thank you for being our star here on earth. A shining light. There go Kasha in the back. Thank you, Kasha, for... <laughs> Uh, Thank you, <laughs> yeah, right on time with the Equinox. All right, family, that is our program for the evening. Have a great one. All right. Peace, everybody. Peace.